right, thanks, Alex. Um, so welcome to the last session. I'll try to keep on time, get everybody out. Um, my talk is the last talk, so I have the honor of, uh, hopefully everybody's still here once I get my talk. Um, each speaker we're gonna have come up is uh, um, gonna give a quick 15, 20 minute presentation. Um, some great talk plans are gonna cover from the elbow to the, to the wrist. Um, just to introduce myself, I practice out of Anaheim, California. I'm a hand and upper extremity surgeon with Kaiser in Orange County, but I also uh, help teach residents and fellows at uh, University of California, Irvine. And um, our, our first speaker, uh, Eric Henson, comes from UCSD, just down the street. And uh, he's an associate professor of orthopedic surgery there, and also the director of hand surgery uh, and upper extremity surgery at the VA Medical Center in uh, San Diego. He's gonna talk to us about peripheral nerve injury and repair. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, I know a lot of people in the room probably don't do a lot of nerve surgery, and so we'll we'll jump right in here and, and talk about a little bit about nerve injury as a background, and then evaluation and current repair techniques. Here's my disclosures. Um, this doesn't look like the thing. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, nerve injury, peripheral nerve injury encompasses a wide spectrum of disability. Uh, these can be things from com chronic compression or crush injuries to sharp lacerations. 75% uh, of the treated nerve injuries are in the upper extremity, and um, the prognosis for these is, is really kind of iffy, and with only about 50% regaining useful function. Uh, the good thing is there's a lot of research going on. On a cellular level, uh, this is not <laughs> Sorry, this is not the talk that I thought I was going to be given. Okay, on a cellular level, um, the axons and the Schwann cells are the two important um, factors. The axon is what transmits the um, ner nerve signal itself, and then the Schwann cells are the supporting myelin. They help, they help um, make the transmission better and, and also are important in regrowth of the axons. Uh, basic anatomy, there are three layers of the nerve. The epineurium is the exter external supporting barrier. The perineurium, which sur surrounds each fascicle, uh, is important in that it gives the most strength to the nerve. And then the endoneurium surrounds ind individual nerve fibers. When there's an injury, there is a zone of injury that can be small in the, in the case of a laceration, or it can be quite wide if you have a big crush or mangled uh, extremity. Distal to the, the level of the zone of injury, where the axon is uh, injured, uh, a process called Wallerian degeneration occurs in which both the, the distal portion of the axon as well as all the glial elements break down. This is moderated by the Schwann cells and um, only occurs if there is axonal disruption. It starts within a day or so of the injury and, and continues for several, a couple months at least. This Wallerian degeneration is necessary before regeneration can occur. Uh, at the level of the injury, the axon regenerates from a growth cone, which moves one to two millimeters a day, or about an inch a month. The surrounding structures in the basal lamina are what guide the axon back to its end, end organs. Um, and as this uh, growth cone advances, the Schwann cells realign and uh, obtain their more normal uh, morphology to allow function to occur. Injury classification was um, first done by Seddon in 1942 and then Sunderland in 1951. And this is important because it um, is important for prognosis. Uh, just going through the Seddon classification, which is easier and, and, and very pertinent, neuropraxia is the most mild type. And the, in this, there is no disruption of the axon. And so there's no Wallerian degeneration. And we expect full recovery in these cases, or near, nearly full recovery. In axonotmesis, the axon is disrupted, but at least certain portions of the surrounding structures are in continuity. And Sunderland, this is where Sunderland uh, subdivided it, whether the endoneurium, epineurium, perineurium is intact. And then neurotmesis is a complete transection of the nerve. In a neurotme neurotmesis, we don't expect any recovery without an intervention. And in axonotmesis, there can be variable recovery. And there's just that. Other prognostic factors are important. The age is important. Younger people do better, as in most things, with uh, people in their 20s or younger definitely doing better than olders. Uh, the level of the lesion is also important. Because the axon has to regenerate from where it was injured, the closer it is to its end organ, the better they will, in general, do. The type of nerve injured is important, with sensory recovery better than motor in most cases. 
the cause of injury or the zone of injury. So if it's a crush, it does worse than a laceration. Those factor in. And then the delay from injury to repair. This, this is something that the surgeon actually has some control of over uh, in contrast to the others. Clinical examination is important. Uh, first of all, it lets you define the level of injury and the degree of injury by looking at what sensory function is out, which, which uh, muscles are working or not, you can determine where the, the injury occurred. Also, if you have distal muscles that are still functioning, and if they're not functioning normally, then you know you don't have a neurotonesis. It's also important to carefully document your initial exam because this gives you a baseline to compare to later with serial exams to see if there is any recovery and the rate of the recovery. If you have an open injury, of course, you have to evaluate the wound itself. You can see if it's clean or dirty. If there's a lot of necrotic tissue, you can evaluate how wide the zone of injury is and also uh, other associated injuries that may factor into your treatment. Um, for peripheral nerve injuries, imaging is in most cases not really necessary, but it can be helpful in certain cases. When you decide to use it, I would say the, the uh, imaging modality of choice is ultrasound. It's very available, it's cheap. It's reliable, um, and it's very good at assessing for continuity, um, as well as neuroma or scar formation. It is, however, somewhat um, driver dependent. MRI can show you pretty much all the same things. It can get to nerves that ultrasound can't see, and it can also give you some information about the other uh, surrounding structures. Um, imaging is useful if you have an obtunded patient and you can't get an exam. Um, possibly if this, the patient has been operated before somewhere outside and it's unclear what's going on. So, so it's something to consider. Uh, an electrodiagnostic studies such as nerve conduction or EMG, uh, these allow us to do multiple things. Um, in the acute setting, the nerve conduction study, which measures conduction along different segments of the nerve, can help you localize the injury. Again, clinical exam typically can do this, but in an obtunded patient, an NCS can be helpful acutely. The EMG it is not uh, useful acutely. It does not, this is, this is showing the muscles, the muscle, the end organs uh, response to nerve injury, and it doesn't become abnormal for several weeks after the injury. Uh, so initially you can't tell if you have a neuropraxia versus a full nerve transection. Uh, so these are some indications that you may be able to use that for. Uh, Okay, as far as nerve repair, um, what are the indications for nerve repair? So if you know you have a complete transection or neurotmesis, then you know you need to fix this. This is um, most commonly occurs with open injuries. In a closed injury, it's a lot of times more difficult to know if you need to do surgery or not. You can't tell a neurotmesis from a, a dense neuropraxia. In these cases, the typical protocol is to wait for three to six weeks, get, in, get your uh, clinical exam initially, Compare this to, ex to the exam after several weeks. If there's good improvement, some you, you know you have a neuropraxia or at least an incomplete injury. Also, an EMG is obtained at three to six weeks because, again, this is where it first starts to show um, changes. And this baseline EMG is important, again, for following recovery, as EMG will show signs of reinnervation much earlier than even clinical exam. EMGs can be then uh, serially obtained every six weeks or eight weeks to follow the progress uh, in the sort of questionable ones, whether you don't know if you're going to need to do surgery or not. Again, imaging can be useful. A lot of times you can do this delayed if you at your six-week mark still have no, no function at all. You can uh, get an ultrasound and assess for continuity. If you see that there are, the nerve is discontinuous on imaging or if there's no recovery on EMG by three to six months, then uh, um, exploration and repair is indicated. Okay, when you decide you're going to have to fix the nerve, always remember the best treatment is immediate direct repair. That's always the answer if, if it's possible. Uh, with delay, you have lots of things that can happen. First of all, there's scarring in the bed and there's also scarring in the nerve. Uh, scarring in the bed makes the dissection more difficult. It makes it more traumatic to get the nerve mobilized and neuralized, and, and it just makes it more difficult ar around the nerve. Scarring within the nerve um, will block the fascicles and block regrowth, and again, makes lining up the nerve for repair more difficult. However, 
primary repair is not always possible. Uh, first of all, you have to have a clean wood wound. You can't do the repair if there's an active infection or a lot of necrotic tissue. The necrotic tissue has no good blood supply and you won't get good healing without that. Um, in some cases of a crush, you know you're going to have to fix the nerve, but it's not really clear how much of the nerve is damaged. And in, so those, in those cases, we may wait s several weeks to see what, what, which nerve looks good and which doesn't. And then you have to have good soft tissue coverage and skeletal stability. So when you decide to do a direct repair, the goal, again, this is a basic tenant. You need to get a tension-free repair. It's been shown over and over that tension causes gapping, increased scar formation, and ischemia, and all of these things lead to poorer outcomes. Um, in order to get a tension-free repair, a neurolysis is always indicated. This can be very minimal in a sharp laceration, or you can do a very long neurolysis. In some areas, such as around the elbow, a transposition of the nerve may be able to give you significantly more leg, even up to three centimeters. Technical considerations for direct repair, uh, again, you need to do the neurolysis to de decrease your tension and sometimes you can close a gap that otherwise would have been there. Also, you always have to resect back to healthy nerve. So you need to uh, resect nerve back to normal looking, people will say pouting fascicles and this has to be on both sides of the, uh, the defect. Um, a very common cause of failure is the, or the lack of resection of this interposed dead or scarred tissue. It's, uh, we, it's sort of at odds with our goal of getting a tension-free repair, but these two th both of those things are necessary. Always you need to have ge gentle tissue handling. These are um, fragile tissues, and the microscope is helpful both in your dissection and determining what's viable and what's not, and, and in actually um, performing the repair. Um, epineural versus fascicular repair. People will talk about this a lot, and really there's not much difference in results for these. Um, the exception may be the ulnar nerve at the wrist where the motor fascicles are fairly easily defined and uh, fairly easily repaired. And when we use small sutures, usually 8 to 10 O, depending on the size of the nerve. So what happens when you have a gap and you cannot get a tension-free repair? This is a very common scenario. It occurs with uh, crush injuries with a wide zone, also when there's delays in repair, also if there's a tumor or a neuroma that has to be excised. There's a bunch of options for gaps, and that's what we'll talk about for the next part of this. The gold standard for gaps is autograph nerve. So that's the other thing. There's never anything better than autograph nerve. It preserves the nerve architecture. It has growth factors inherent to it that promote nerve regrowth. And since it's autographed, it's non-immunogenic. It also, however, has significant uh, drawbacks. And the big one that everybody worries about and, is, and the reason that we look for alternatives is the donor site morbidity. This nerve does something uh, normally, and so you're going to have a, typically a sensory defect with harvest of this nerve. There's also potential for complications at the donor site, such as neuroma or scar formation. Uh, autograph nerve also has limited availability. Um, for a nerve to be um, a suitable for autograft, it has to have tolerable donor site morbidity, sufficient length and caliber to span the gap that you're trying to fix, and ease of harvest is also a plus. For, for these reasons, cutaneous sensory nerves are almost exclusively the nerves of choice. Uh, the sural nerve is the most common because it is long, it's very expendable, and the donor site morbidity is, is minimal. The technical considerations for, for grafting are the same basically as for primary repair, except you have two repair sites. Again, you want tension-free repair, and therefore the autograft is always taken a little bit longer than the defect. Also, the nerves that are being repaired with graft are typically fairly good-sized nerves, and the Cutaneous sensory nerves are always fairly small, and so cabling is very common, where you lay several lengths of the donor in, in parallel to span the graft, or to, to span the defect. And here's just a, a illustration of that, an ulnar nerve defect, which with a three-length cabling of sural nerve. You see that there's some laxity in that. Okay. 
So to, to avoid the donor site morbidity and also uh, the availability issues, people have looked for multiple alternatives. The alternative that's, that's closest to autograft is nerve allograft. Because it's coming from a cadaver, there's no morbidity and there's almost an unlimited supply. In, in certain situations, the potential recovery is very, very near to autograft as well. There are really two options for allograft. First is tissue allograft, which is a donated cadaver um, nerve that is minimally processed. And then there's also decellularized autograft. The first uh, tissue allograft nerves were done in the 1800s, and it was evident from these that there was problems with immunogenicity. Uh, currently, graft processing is used to really decrease this, but patients still need two years of immunosuppression and all the things that come along with that. And so this is not really available to most hand surgeons. It is done in certain centers and with good results. Much more available to us is decellularized allograft. Um, this isn't really an ad, but Axigen Avance is really is, is the only one that's available in the U.S. for this. It's highly processed and acellular to make it non-immunogenic and also to sort of modulate the surface molecules to promote uh, axon re-ingrowth. The thing that it has is it has the structural architecture maintained with microtubules and laminins to, to direct the nerve to where it needs to go. Um, the results for this have been looked, so this is relatively new stuff. I say in the, in the last five years or so, it's really taken off. And there's good data that for sensory nerve gaps up to three centimeters, it does well. For larger gaps, there are reports of, of very good results uh, out to seven or even longer uh, centimeters, but there's much less data on that. Also for motor or mixed nerves, the data is very sparse. In animals, it does seem clear that the allograft doesn't do as well as autograft for these larger gaps or for um, motor nerve. A simpler and uh, slightly cheaper um, option is conduits. These are simple tubes that uh, incorporate the nerve gap. Uh, they have several things that they help with, the re with, with uh, recovery. First of all, they direct axon regrowth. They keep the sprouting uh, growth plates from going willy-nilly all over everywhere. Also, they keep scar from coming in from the outside and, and prov provide this barrier to fibrosis. Uh, they may concentrate growth factors secreted from the nerve ends in the space between the two nerve ends. Biologic um, conduits have been used since the 1800s. These were veins and arteries, and synthetic ones have been available of, um, since about the 1980s, and there's multiple uh, commercial types available. Whoops. Okay. The, as if you look through the literature for conduits, uh, it's clear that these are best only for small sensory nerves. Uh, there, it's, there's good um, evidence that you can use these for short gaps up to about three centimeters. They definitely don't do as well as autograft or even allograft at larger than three centimeters. Um, and even at shorter distance, less than three centimeters, autograft or allograft seem to do quite a bit better. Another really good use for conduits, however, is augmentation of primary repair. So you have uh, direct repair, um, but you can wrap this direct repair with a conduit to keep the axons aligned and to, to prevent fibrosis in that area. It also provides some stru structural strength to your repair. Uh, the disadvantages of this, again, it's, it's commercial, so it costs something, and then there's no architecture or Schwann cells there. Okay, so in summary, uh, always remember, primary repair without tension is what you want to get if you can get it. However, there are a lot of cases where this is impossible. You can never go wrong with autograft. It's the gold standard. There is not really any incidence where you can show that that does better than, or that that does worse than anything else. Uh, however, it does have the uh, donor site morbidity associated with it. Classic allograft with immunosuppression is uh, available only in certain centers, but does have a place and is still being looked at. Decellularized allograft is really being studied right now. Um, it's good for gaps from one to three centimeters, really, and sensory nerves primarily, um, but can be, there is some evidence for, for use in that in longer defects. And then conduits are really, they're, uh, they're good for up to three centimeters, but really good for shorter gaps and for an adjunct to direct repair. And 
And so this is just a sort of a graph of the way I think about it. Less than a centimeter, I try to get mobilization and direct repair with or, with or, out, with or without a conduit. Conduits I'll use out to about a centimeter and a half or two. Uh, the decellularized allograft out to about three, and you can push the indications for that some, and then autograft, you can use whenever, uh, especially with motor or mixed nerves.